Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you all. Welcome to this uh, uh, new uh, tax talks. Uh, I'm uh, glad uh, not to see you. I'm, I'm sad not to see you, but I'm glad that you join uh, for these uh, tax talks, which we plan the day where a number of people are on vacation. So happy holiday to you all. But the day where the G20 finance deputies are negotiating the communique uh, and we'll be talking about the um, um, delivery uh, of the uh, tax uh, elements of the G20 discussion that finance ministers uh, will touch upon on Wednesday. So we were happy to release today the uh, OECD uh, Secretary General's report on tax and we'll go through it with you. But first, uh, some housekeeping uh, things and I turn uh, back to Hazel. Hazel, please. Thank you very much, Pascal. Uh, yes, so some light housekeeping for today. Uh, for those following on Zoom, uh, please note that the chat function is not um, functioning today for security reasons. For those on Zoom, you are invited to submit your questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of the interface. For those watching on OECD TV, please submit your questions to ctpcontact at oecd.org. These questions will be moderated and we will do our best to address them in the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. As usual, this webinar is being recorded and all registered participants will be notified by email when the replay is available. And last but not least, for those active on social media, you can use the hashtag OECD Tax Talks. Over to you, Pascal. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Hazel. And we can move on uh, so that uh, I can present you the uh, speakers of today. Uh, next, uh, we have uh, Grace Perez Navarro, uh, who's the deputy director of the Center for Tax Policy and Administration, David Bradbury and Osa Johansson, who have worked jointly on the impact assessment. Uh, we have Arim Pros, uh, who has coordinated the work on Pillar 1 and led the work on Pillar 2. And we also have Michelle Harding, who you know, she's participated a couple of times on revenue statistics, but uh, this time together with Julien Jarige, uh, she will present the work we've done on the taxation of crypto assets. And some of you may have seen, we are also joined by my cat who is fascinated by tax and by Zoom. Apologies for the disruption uh, because of the cat. If we can move on. Uh, I will, next slide please, Sonia. Thank you. Uh, the topics which will be discussed uh, today, the digital package, I think that's the big thing you all want to, to hear uh, about. Uh, with an overview I will deliver, then uh, uh, Osa and uh, David will talk to, to you about the impact assessment, Grace on pillar one, Arim on pillar two. Then we'll move to the taxation of virtual currencies and uh, crypto assets uh, and uh, try to see what's the agenda uh, beyond digital because uh, while we were working on digital, uh, many other things uh, were happening. The forthcoming publications and we'll leave time for the Q and A's. Uh, we have already received a number of very good questions and we thank you for this. So we'll try right now to go to the digital package and uh, the overview. Uh, and uh, on the overview, um, I would first like uh, to um, uh, remind you of the fact that last week on Thursday and Friday, the full inclusive framework met. Uh, we had uh, present in the virtual room 130 jurisdictions, a bit more than 600 uh, delegates participating in the discussion uh, together with uh, 13 international organizations. So that's the upside of uh, Zoom and uh, virtual meetings. You can have a large number of people uh, and you don't deteriorate your carbon balance by attending uh, meetings. Uh, the downside, of course, is that the engagement is not the same and uh, you don't have the coffee breaks and you don't have the lunch or the dinner, all the conversations which take place in the corridors and uh, which uh, are actually the place where the tax cooperation is uh, really uh, taking place. Um, these delegates uh, have agreed a significant package 
uh, and the significant package includes a cover statement which states uh, what uh, the level of agreement uh, is. They have agreed for public release a report on pillar one blueprint, a report on pillar two blueprints, and they agreed uh, that uh, there would be a public consultation starting today. So that's the official launch of the public consultation, uh, and uh, which uh, will last until the 14th of December uh, on both blueprints. Next. The background very quickly, you know it, but uh, always good uh, to remind you of it. The BEP section plan agreed in 2013 with an action one dealing with the digitalization of the economy. Uh, the uh, action one report at the end of um, uh, 15, actually literally five years ago, it was the 5th of October, I think the fifth anniversary of the delivery of the BEPS package with an action one report which was not really conclusive, except that we should not reinvent the digital economy. In 2018, responding to a request from Germany in 2017, we issued an interim report. And there, there was a door open for a multilateral negotiation of a multilateral consensus-based solution. And since then, we've worked extremely hard with all the delegates, with all the members of the inclusive framework, uh, with in January 19, the recognition that there should be a two pillar approach to solve the problem. Uh, in May 19, the adoption of a program of work and in January earlier this year, the outline of a, a common approach, a unified approach to address uh, the issues under pillar one and the progress note on pillar two. And we were supposed to deliver a consensus-based solution by July. And uh, let's say it right now, we have not, we did not deliver in July and we are not delivering a full agreement today, but we'll see that actually uh, we can see uh, the glass half full in spite of what I've just said, uh, which uh, makes it look like uh, half empty. Uh, in July, the G20 finance minister said, we hope we can reach an agreement by year end. Uh, we'll see what they agree uh, on Wednesday, but it's quite unlikely. I think they will recognize that there is no agreement, but as you will see, there is a good dynamic uh, to move towards an agreement in 21, in spite of the difficulties which shouldn't be underestimated. Next. <clears throat> the um, uh, amount of work I think is, is worth noting. So we're not just issuing documents which would be secretariat document or easy paper, easy papers, but uh, we had um, uh, almost 70 days of virtual meetings of the different working parties, working party one tax treaties, working party six on transfer pricing, working party 11 on aggressive tax planning, the task force on the digital economy, the steering group, uh, which includes 24 members and the full inclusive framework. We uh, have uh, received a significant number of uh, comments uh, on the different blueprints. Uh, and uh, we also were extremely active with uh, all the members for the impact assessment. You can see more than 200 tools shared with countries to estimate the revenue impact. The OECD has done some work and the countries drawing on the instruments we developed has also, have also done the work. Now let's move to um, the um, uh, status of uh, the package. So the first key message is both pillars, both blueprint reports are released for public comments. We heard the uh, criticism by a number of stakeholders that they had not had the opportunity to properly comment on the blueprints. And um, um, because of the delay in the negotiation, <clears throat> we thought that it would be appropriate to take advantage of the upcoming two months or three to do a proper public consultation. So both Peter, both blueprints are released for public uh, comment. The impact assessment is also agreed um, by, I mean, agreed, is published by the Secretariat. <clears throat> I have to highlight that it is not a consensus-based document and usually is never the case with impact assessment. It's done by independent economists trying to do the best job possible. 
Um, and that's what uh, Osa and David uh, have done. So you have uh, broad figures, uh, they will come back to that. Uh, you have grouped figures, you don't have country specific figures because members didn't allow us to uh, go uh, that far. However, you have the full details of the methodology uh, which may help you play with some numbers and try to come up with your own impact assessment. What is the level of agreement? That's uh, the next slide, Sonia, please. Uh, as I indicated earlier, you can see the glass half full of the glass half empty, even though the scheme seems to go in one direction. Actually, it really depends on your point of view. So why would the glass be uh, half empty? If you look, at the chapeau, because we prepared a chapeau which has been agreed by the full inclusive framework and it's part of the package which is released today. It's a cover statement of one page and a half, nine paragraphs. Uh, this cover statement recognizes in particular in paragraphs five and seven, five is on pillar one, seven is on pillar two, that there is no agreement though no agreement has been reached. And I think it's a recognition uh, which is just about uh, honesty. Uh, we have not reached agreement. However, and that's where one could think that the glass is half full, the blueprints nevertheless provides a solid foundation for a future agreement. I think what is extremely important to have in mind is the uh, different options we uh, could have faced where uh, one say there is no agreement, uh, we have reports, they're interesting documents, we put them on the shelves and, and each country uh, follows its own path, unilateral measures or no measure, and uh, we keep uh, with the status quo. This clearly is not an option uh, that the inclusive framework has uh, considered. Uh, another option would have been full agreement. And as I indicated, I think the COVID crisis uh, clearly deprived us of uh, any chance to uh, conclude agreement, even though without COVID, we may not have reached the full agreement because there are significant uh, pending issues. Um, uh, the third option, uh, being what uh, has been um, uh, agreed here, which is to say there is uh, indeed a lot of work, there is agreement on a direction, there is agreement on what the solutions could be, and that's what Grace and Arim will describe to you all. There is agreement on the architecture of P1, the fact that there must be a new nexus, that there must be a way to address the allocation of residual profits, uh, but there are also um, uh, disagreement on the scope, on the modalities uh, of, of, of all that. So um, uh, what uh, is important, I think, is that the inclusive framework has agreed that this is the basis, a solid foundation for a future agreement. And uh, you can see another quote from the uh, chapeau, the recognition that a lot of work has been done, not just to say, oh, we've, we've checked the box, work is done, but this work has advanced us all towards uh, the finalization of a solution with the key policy features, principles, and parameters of both pillars uh, being uh, well explored. Next. Um, uh, the status of the package. So I quote, uh, we approve the report on pillar one blueprint for public release. And you can see it's quite symmetrical in paragraph seven, which is about uh, pillar two. The fact that the blueprints offer a solid basis for future agreement, I've emphasized that. And the fact it's paragraph six, which indicates that the inclusive framework members will now focus on resolving the remaining political and technical issues. It means that uh, we are now left with a package of issues which uh, are important, but intertwined, which makes us think within the OECD that uh, if one is solved, the others will come together. For instance, to talk about Peter, Peter one, uh, if you solve the scope, and that's not easy to do, but if you 
all the scope, then quickly you will be able to make a more informed decision on the different thresholds, on the different uh, quanta, uh, what is the definition of the residual profit, how much of this residual profit you should reallocate to market jurisdictions, because it comes together and uh, uh, countries have to think of this uh, holistically, which means that um, uh, in spite of lack of agreement, all the conditions to move forward and resolving these remaining political and technical issues are gathered if the political momentum stays. And that's what we are going to see in the next couple of days with the G20. The next paragraph that was a nice move, uh, Sonia, uh, is uh, the conclusion. And here you have a piece of information, pretty important, uh, which is that the inclusive framework, so the members, uh, including the G20 countries, the emerging economies, the developing economies, the other OECD countries, all agreed that uh, they would swiftly address the remaining issues. And they give an indication that all this could be concluded by mid-21 uh, to resolve the technical issues, develop also the model draft legislations, and so may take a bit more than mid-21, but resolving the main uh, issues uh, could be done by then. Um, if we want to summarize where we are, um, in January, we agreed uh, the uh, two pillar approach and to develop the uh, pillars technically. And I mean, an incredible amount of work by the members, but also by the team, which I would like to thank, has been delivered. And we now have the blueprints, the different bricks to build the solution. We just need the okay from the members on a few key features so that we can really build this. And building this, now that the exploratory work has been done, wouldn't take too much time. That's the message which is being conveyed to the G20. Next. Next steps and timeline. Uh, 12th of October today, um, uh, in Genius Day in the, in the US and uh, in Americas, we uh, do the launch of the public uh, consultation. Uh, the finance ministers meet in a couple of days. There will be a discussion probably at the virtual G20 summit in November. On the 14th of December, we will have uh, the comments uh, coming from the public consultation. And early in January, we will do uh, the virtual meetings for the public consultation. So we'll have a few weeks ahead of us uh, for you to comment, for us to reflect on that. There is some work, obviously, to do to facilitate the resolution of the pending issues, maybe to consider some ways of solving them, some simplifications to be introduced in Pillar 1. Pillar 2's consultation in particular is about the administration and simplification. So simplification will be a, a key uh, element of the public consultation. Uh, so busy months ahead, but probably busier for you than for us for once, uh, it's a good change. And uh, now I think we'll move to the next slides and uh, the presentation on uh, the impact assessment first before moving to Pillar 1 and Pillar 2. Uh, Osa and David, over to you. Thanks very much, Pascal. It's great to be able to join you all virtually and to be accompanied by Osa Johansson, my colleague from the economics department. Uh, the impact assessment was carried out jointly by the tax and economics departments with assistance from many others across the OECD. And I just want to acknowledge everyone that contributed. It was a real team effort. Uh, with any economic impact assessment, and in particular, this is an ex ante assessment, there are a whole range of assumptions. Uh, and we've made many assumptions about parameters and the design, uh, because there is no agreement at this point. Uh, but we are obviously also very much subject to the data that's available. Uh, but all of these details are presented uh, very transparently in the impact assessment report. In the coming slides, uh, I will profile some of the highlights based on the default or the, the, the baseline uh, assumptions that we made. And based on those assumptions, we find that the Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 proposals could increase global corporate income tax revenues by about 50 to 80 billion US dollars per year. Now, the combined effect of the reforms along with the US guilty could represent 60 to 100 billion US dollars per year. Well, that's around 
4% of global corporate income tax revenues. The reforms we find would lead to a more favourable environment for investment and growth uh, than would likely be the case in the absence of a consensus-based solution. And we also find that the COVID-19 crisis is likely to accelerate the trend towards digitalisation of the economy. And in doing so, will exacerbate the tax challenges arising from digitalisation if uh, no agreement is reached at the inclusive framework. Now, on the next slide, I'm going to present some details around uh, the revenue impacts, and then I'll hand over to Ossa, who will share with you some of the impacts from an investment perspective. But if we look at this slide here, uh, the panel A on the left-hand side uh, shows the revenue gains as a result of Pillar 1. Of course, Pillar 1 is about a reallocation of taxing rights, uh, but even though it is principally about reallocating those taxing rights, and there will be substantial reallocation, in fact, we estimate around 100 billion US dollars worth of residual profit will be reallocated to market jurisdictions. Um, but it, there will be a modest overall increase in revenues collected. You can see that um, on average, low, middle and high income countries all stand to benefit uh, in terms of revenue gains. Uh, not shown in this graph, uh, but investment hubs stand to, to lose some revenue and indeed uh, to lose tax base as a result of the reforms. Panel B on the right hand side shows the impact of Pillar 2. And you can see that the, the bulk of the revenue gains actually come from Pillar 2. And they come from the direct gains as a result of the globe rules, but they also come from the fact that the implementation of Pillar 2 will reduce the incentives to engage in profit shifting. And that will uh, reduce profit shifting and deliver a benefit to countries as well. Now, across the two pillars, we see that uh, the, the, the impact is broadly similar across low, middle and high income uh, country groupings. Uh, and that is as a share of, of current CIT revenues. At this point, I'll hand over to Wasit to talk about the investment impacts. Thank you, David. So let me go directly to the highlights of the investment analysis. Um, so Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 proposal, they will introduce changes to the international tax rules. And these changes can potentially affect global investment through various channels. And one channel is by affecting firms' investment costs via effect ineffective taxes. So the work that we have done at the OECD on the impact on firms' investment suggests that the proposals would lead to a relatively small increase in multinational firms' investment costs, meaning that the negative effect on global investment would be small. And the reason for this is that many firms will be unaffected by the proposals since the proposals are designed so to target firms with high levels of profitability, which are also firms whose investment decisions are found to be less sensitive to taxation. Moreover, the proposal can affect investment through other channels, which can support investment. For instance, the proposals can have the potential to reduce profit shifting. And the reason for this is that both pillars would reduce tax rate differences across jurisdictions. And differences in taxes are one key driver of profit shifting. And by narrowing the tax differences, this reduces multinational firms' incentive to shift profits as the gains from doing so would be lower. And in turn, this will have implications for economic efficiency as it can lead firms to locate investment based more on market factors rather than tax factors. And this can have positive effect on growth. So on balance, the OECD analysis that we've done suggests that the proposals are likely to have modest effect on global investment. It's also important to keep in mind that the results of the impact of the proposals on investment and growth they have to be compared to a counterfactual scenario without a consensus. And this counterfactual scenario unlikely looks like the current situation we have today. Instead, a failure to achieve consensus could lead to more unilateral measures, uncertainty, and tax and trade disputes. And this clearly would have adverse effect on growth. So on this slide here, the figure illustrates the work that we've done to assess the impact on different tax and trade scenarios on economic growth using standard OECD tools. The chart also shows the impact of the proposals on growth. So the blue bar on the left side shows the impact of the proposals on growth 
working through the impact on firms' investment costs. And the negative impact on growth is estimated to be relatively small, less than 0.1% of global GDP. On the right side of the chart, the brown bar shows the impact of different tax and trade scenarios on growth in the case of no consensus. And in this case, we have modeled different scenarios to illustrate that the magnitude of the impact on economic growth depend on the level and the scope of the implementation of unilateral measures, and also the intensity of trade retaliation to these unilateral measures, both which there is some uncertainty around. So the main takeaway from this chart is the impact of growth is more negative in a no consensus scenario than in a consensus. For instance, in our worst case scenario, with the widespread adoption of unilateral measures and a strong trade retaliation to these measures, tax and trade disputes could reduce global GDP by more than 1%. So these disputes would have an uh, adverse effect on global economy via reducing trade and investment, but it will also affect household incomes via reduction in wages and through higher prices of goods. And this, these adverse effects of a potential trade war is even more important in the current context, since there is an uncertainty around the recovery from the COVID-19 crisis and further tax and trade disputes could add to the effect of the COVID crisis and hinder the recovery. So I'll hand over now to Grace. Thank you, Asa, and hello, everyone. I'm very pleased to also welcome you to this special It's Pascal's birthday edition of Tax Talks. He could think of nothing better than to celebrate his birthday by sharing these pillars uh, with you today. Um, so if we move to the next slide, we're going to start talking about pillar one and what it has delivered. This slide that you see basically sets out what we have accomplished um, over the period since January when we issued the policy statement from the inclusive framework, which was the point in time when the inclusive framework endorsed the unified approach that we had launched last October as a secretariat proposal. And in January, it was uh, the inclusive framework that endorsed uh, the unified approach as a way to move forward and further develop the solution to the tax challenges of the digitalization of the economy. And that statement was accompanied by a work plan for a developing the uh, the unified approach. And so what you can see on this slide is basically all the work that has been carried out by various working parties by the steering group to help deliver uh, this blueprint that we have today. And the, the program of work contained uh, the 11 building blocks of the pillar one solution. And that if we go to the next slide, you will see that um, the building blocks remain unchanged from what you saw in uh, the program of work that we released in January. But of course, um, this hefty pillar one report uh, shows that there's been a lot of flesh put on the bones of each of the building blocks. The building blocks are um, underpinning the three core components of uh, pillar one, which is first the amount A, which is uh, the new taxing right um, that would enable uh, countries to tax uh, what is currently going untaxed as a result of changing business models facilitated by digitalization. Then we had amount B, which you will recall was to establish um, a fixed uh, a fixed approach to um, transfer some basic transfer pricing uh, scenarios, marketing and distribution activities. And uh, then we had what used to be called amount C, but really is more appropriately referred to as the, the tax certainty component, which has both uh, creating uh, new means of providing tax certainty to respond to the new approach we're taking in amount A, which is a formulaic approach, and also to consider enhancing uh, tax certainty uh, for the rest of pillar one. 
So then if we move to the next slide, we will see the main outcomes of the blueprint. And here, um, what you have is essentially um, both the, the commitments and areas where there's broad uh, agreement or a convergence of views as our uh, the statement by the inclusive framework suggests. But you can see there that they have committed to developing a new taxing right that is not exclusively circumscribed by reference to a physical presence of the multinational group. They have committed to develop a solution anchored in that basis taxation albeit one that is uh, using a formulaic approach for allocating profits for uh, the businesses that would be within the scope of this solution. Uh, the solution would be targeted and build in thresholds so that it would minimize compliance costs for taxpayers and keep the administration of the rules manageable uh, for tax administrations. Um, so that's quite important in framing uh, the amount A solution. The amount A solution uh, would be computed using consolidated financial accounts as a starting point with certain limited book to tax adjustments. And it would ensure that uh, losses are appropriately taken into account, though this is one of the issues um, that remains to be further refined what, what we are uh, talking about in terms of the losses that would be taken into account. Um, in, in determining the tax base, segmentation would be required to appropriately target the new taxing right um, in certain cases, but with uh, broad safe harbor or exemption rules being proposed uh, from segmentation to reduce complexity and minimize the burdens for tax administrations and taxpayers alike. Now, given the formulaic approach and the use of consolidated financial accounts, obviously uh, it will be important to eliminate the risk of double taxation. And so there is a commitment to ensure that the solution contains an effective means for doing so in a multilateral setting. Now, if we turn to amount B, you'll see in the cover statement that there is a reference to the fact that this work will continue to be advanced and um, that this is um, something that has very uh, significant potential benefits for tax administrations, in particular those in developing countries and other countries with limited capacity um, to uh, carry out traditional transfer pricing um, for these baseline marketing and distribution activities. Then um, the pillar one solution would also contain a new multilateral tax certainty process with respect to amount A, recognizing the importance of using simplified and coordinated administrative procedures with respect to the um, administration of amount A. And so that is also an area where further work will have to be carried out because this is a new uh, approach. We've also uh, seen in the statement that the inclusive framework uh, has uh, indicated that a new multilateral convention would be developed to implement the solution as that would be the fastest and most efficient way to secure consistent implementation of the solution. And uh, then last but not least, um, efforts will be made to try to minimize the complexity of the solution, um, as well as the compliance burdens as so far as possible. And here's where uh, we count on stakeholders input to help us uh, get to that point. We recognize, as I think Pascal uh, said earlier, that there is um, quite a bit of complexity and that we do hope to try and minimize that going forward. So um, there is an awful lot of uh, convergence around uh, the items that I mentioned, but there's also further work uh, that has to be carried out and that is in progress. Um, there are still some uh, important po policy um, issues that have to be 
resolved, as Pascal mentioned, and as is clear in the, um, the statement that was released by the inclusive framework. And um, many of these policy issues are really around the issue of scope. You will have seen that in the proposed solution, we have defined certain activities, automated digital services, and also consumer facing business. Um, but the, the precise scope, there are issues remaining within that. There's also the issue uh, that was raised by the United States last December about um, looking at whether this should be mandatory or whether it should be a safe harbor that uh, companies could choose uh, as opposed to making it mandatory. There's the whole issue of quantum, that is how much of the profit would be considered residual profit and then what percentage of that would be reallocated. Um, there's the, the extent of tax certainty that remains to be resolved. So be you know the extent of tax certainty for amount A and then beyond amount A and of course, this is a question that for many countries depends on what the ultimate scope is. So resolving the scope issue uh, sooner rather than later will help us move forward um, in getting to uh, the full consensus-based solution. And then there are a number of technical issues that have to be dealt with um, and those will be continued uh, going forward as we wait for the stakeholder input, but um, the working parties will continue to working so to work on these issues. So um, that work will remain underway. So a lot of convergence, but also a lot of uh, technical issues that remain to be resolved. And with that, I will turn it to Aachen. And thank you, Grace, and welcome to everybody. Yes, I'll give you three slides on pillar two in less than seven minutes. And of course, had we known that it's Pascal's birthday, we would have at least agreed pillar two. I think it raises enough revenue, as David tells us, to pay at least for a virtual birthday party. Um, we will have to wait for that, not too long, but just a little bit. Um, so three slides on, on pillar two. We can go to the first slide. In some sense, that's the slide you've seen where we come from. There's a lot of work in 219. There's a lot of work in 220. And it looks like the work will continue, um, both on a number of political issues, but also on a number of technical issues um, into 2021. Uh, the important point here, I guess, is Pascal and Grace and others have said, this isn't sort of the work of the Secretariat. This is the work of the Inclusive Framework. Um, the delegates are extremely busy. Um, throughout the pandemic and have met repeatedly on days and you see the papers and the turnaround. Um, and, and there's a lot of technical expertise that is being brought here. We've also benefited from an earlier public consultation with business. We try to stay in touch as much as this is possible. And just to give you an indication of sort of what's happening here while you might not be seeing it because it doesn't happen physically, it is still happening quite extensively. Um, we have apparently slept a little bit over the last year and we intend to do it a little more, as Pascal says, over the next day or two, and then probably it's back to the pillars. Um, now, if we look at the next slide, uh, most of you will know this. This is what the pillar looks like. Um, you've seen, we've released it earlier today. Some of you may have already seen it earlier, so, so no big surprises. I'm not trying to take you through 250 pages. Um, maybe just a couple of points to highlight that may be of interest. Um, one, you see the GLOBE rules, the Income Inclusion Rule and the under tax Payment Rule. You see the Subject to Tax Rule. You don't separately see the Switch Over Rule, uh, which you used to see in the beginning, largely because people have accepted that the Switch Over Rule is largely supporting the application of the Income Inclusion Rule, where otherwise there might be an obstacle as a result of a particular treaty that requires the use of the exemption method. And so you'll still find it, but you see it as part of the discussion of the income inclusion rule. So that's perhaps one point to note. Then structurally, um, as you know, there's the income inclusion rule, the under tax payment rule, and they go together. They're essentially the same rules. They have all the same components, which in significant part we've also done to simplify the structure. And they're being supplemented by the subject to the tax rule that has a slightly different design. It's also based on more nominal approach. 
um, rather than the effective tax rate approach that you see in um, the income inclusion and the under tax payment rule. One is the structural, more if you wish, infrastructure rule, and the other one is a more specific one that specifically looks at bilateral circumstances where countries may have ceded taxing rights in the expectation that there would be a certain level of tax, and when that is not achieved, then the subject to tax rule comes in. They go together. I think it's also quite clear in the political process that there will be no consensus agreement without a subject to tax being part of the package. And I think many of these sentiments around where we are and the status, not just on the design, are also expressed in the shuffle statement that you've seen that has been endorsed by all of the 137 members of the inclusive framework. So then quickly running through the different parts here and maybe starting with the globe rules that you see on the left here, the various chapters, you have a chapter on scope, we're going to go through scope, I think broadly is relatively stable, I think this is not for the small businesses, it's not for the medium sized enterprises, it's for the large ones, we can leverage off the existing work that MEs have already done as a result of the implementation of country by country reporting, so that should make it easier. Um, we also have the consolidation principle, the control standard is clear, we have a certain number of excluded entity and that also seems a broadly stable is a question on shipping, but otherwise I think the scope chapter is relatively stable. Similarly, on the calculation of the jurisdictional ETR, that's the tax space that you need and the covered taxes, I think uh, we've taken the comments on board, many coming in from businesses, but equally from uh, um, civil society of using financial accounts, we are using financial accounts. Uh, we're not making book-to-book -book adjustments, so IFRS is as good as US GAAP. Um, there is a limited number of book-to-tax adjustments, dividends, stock-based comp, a couple of those that, that you know and that there will not be uh, surprising for business to see. I think we have a model for carry-forwards, carry-forwards both of excess taxes and also carry-forwards of losses through a memorandum of accounts. I'm going to talk about this in a moment. I think the models are developing quite clearly, so a good level of stability. We have carve-outs, we have some defined carve-outs and the methodology. Uh, there are some open questions, but also you see a relatively clear design here, purely from a technical perspective. Um, there's a whole chapter on simplifications. I'm gonna use my remaining couple of minutes on the next slide just to focus on the simplifications. So I'm not gonna jump over there. I'm still on the, on the last slide, so I'm not jumping quite yet. So if you can go back. And then you see um, the other chapter six and seven that deal with the income inclusion rule, meaning there is an attribution to the country of the shareholder or where there is no good income inclusion rule, there is then an application of the so-called under tax payment rule. And of course that, that also applies to the extent that it affects the parent group should it be low tax. There's a couple of special rules. You see this somewhat in the middle, the chapter eight, I'm gonna skip those. These are special rules um, that are outside the consolidation context. Then there is the subject to tax rule, very important with some critical questions. I think that we have, what's the scope that, that still needs to be finalized? What's the administration? How can we make it work for all concerns in particular for developing countries? What's a way of, of making this easy enough for in particular lower capacity? Also, what's the status? So, so much technical work still needed, but a full recognition. And we also say in the statement that um, there will be no consensus solution unless uh, an, an uh, subject to tax rule is part of the package. And then importantly, the last part, as we've always said, rule coordination, chapter 10, we've always said, you know, these rules should not apply at the same time. We don't want to go from no taxation or low taxation to double taxation. We do not want to tax um, in excess of economic profit. They seek to ensure this There's a clear rule order which they apply. There's discussions on the treaty compatibility, the coordination question, in particular also where there is the under tax payment rule that would be applied in a, in a number of jurisdictions simultaneous, raising questions on administration with standardized documentation ideas, including also, as is mentioned here, on dispute prevention. And then there's an example, and of course with, with annexes, with examples, as, as we always do, um, just to illustrate how this works, if you don't want to read the example because you think it gets too long, then do not read the example. Um, then the last slide here, and I'm running through this quite quickly here, uh, design and compliance simplifications. I think as Grace has mentioned, one of the core um, driving principles here is to try to make this simple, but at the same time recognizing that a global minimum tax addressing residual BEPS issues comes with a certain degree of complexity and there's trade-offs that we need to make. Um, Many of the stakeholders have come in and said, look, you need to make some adjustments from the base. Don't just use financial accounts. We need to have some carve-outs. All of these things make it more complicated by 
necessity. And so we need to then listen to the accuracy, getting the policy right, and also getting the simplification right. So that needs to be seen in a wider context. This is a list of several things where delegates have gone through and said, look, there's a couple of things where we have choices. Let's also consider in the design simplifications aspects, the scope to go over the threshold that we do a consolidation test, a black and white, if you wish, excluded entities list that's relatively easy to apply on the base, use of financial accounts, many other things. Um, the mechanism to address timing differences where ongoing work is still needed to just make sure that people don't drop into the mintex simply because of immediate expensing or accelerated depreciation. Also, more work and looking forward to engagement with business and others. Blending, building off and leveraging CBC that we've already implemented. Rule design. Rule design is essentially something that's much more mechanical and bright line that we might be used to it. Less facts and circumstances, less subjective determinations that we'll have to make and design an application of the rules. Um, rule order, where there is a rule order that's also influenced simply by what's the easier rule order to apply for tax administration, also for taxpayers, coordination, simplification, standardization, systemic checks to make sure that one knows easily whether the under tax payment rule applies or not, and means to avoid double taxation should there be issues around it. Um, subject to tax, um, at least it, it builds off a, a nominal rate, so, so that's an easier concept, I guess, and it's limited to those categories that have to be further agreed and developed. Finally, I think, and without the time not permitting, but there's a whole chapter, read it carefully about simplifications, also important that those are the ideas that people in the working parties had about, like, what is it that we can do to make it simpler? Um, those might not be the only ideas, very open for engagement over the next couple of months. And that's a big part of the consultations, getting your ideas on how can we achieve the tax policy objective, but do it in a way that reduces, minimizes compliance costs, which ones of these ideas are good. And of course, a recognition that it does make sense to agree simplifications prior to a consultation, not that we uh, come up with simplifications that turn out to be more complicated for you and in particular businesses that will apply these rules. So stay tuned, engage with us on these questions of administration, implementation, operation. Um, we look forward to engagement, and I think I hand it over, not quite sure, but I hand it over to the next speaker. And that would be me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, sorry, it's not me. It's Michelle and Julianne. Thanks, Grace. Uh, together with my colleague Julien, we're going to give you a short update on another report that the OECD released today, which is our study on the taxation of virtual currencies. The stakes are high in this space. The virtual currency market is worth over 350 billion US dollars, and the market is also evolving rapidly. The report that we've released today was prepared with the active participation of more than 50 countries, and it's the first comprehensive tax policy analysis for such a large group of countries. In the report, we covered the different policy approaches that countries are taking to income taxes, as well as to consumption and property taxes. We also analyze some of the emerging issues which can have tax policy implications now and in the future. These include in particular the rise of stable coins, uh, also the related development of central bank digital currencies in, in many countries. And we also took a look at how changes in blockchain's consensus mechanisms, as well as the development of decentralized finance can affect tax policy. I'll hand over now to Julian, who's going to take the next slide and we'll discuss some of the key insights for policymakers. Thank you, Michel, and good afternoon to you all. Uh, we summarize on the screen four main insights uh, for countries wishing to improve the legal framework on the taxation of virtual currencies. First, they should provide clear and regularly updated guidance, in particular to ensure consistency with the treatment of other assets, and notably intangible ones. Second, countries can support compliance and in turn improve certainty, including through simplified rules on valuation, uh, and for small or occasional trades, for instance, with exemption thresholds. Countries should also align the tax treatment of virtual currencies with other policy objectives or trends, such as the decline in the use of cash, which is being accelerated by the COVID-19 pandemic, but also environmental considerations, since many virtual currencies can actually prove energy intensive. Finally, countries should consider developing guidance on the taxation of emerging issues, so there is, a, for instance, a question on whether the existing treatments may be appropriate for stable coins or for decentralized finance. On that note, I will thank you and turn back to Pascal.
I think it's actually me. Go ahead, Grace. <laughs> Julianne. Um, we're now going to go, as Pascal said earlier, to briefly cover, because we're running a little bit late, but briefly cover some of the other work uh, that has continued during this full, very intensive period of working on the tax challenges of digitalization. So uh, if we could go to the next slide, you'll see that the BEPS implementation work has continued. Um, under Action 5, we have reviewed over 290 tax regimes to determine whether or not these preferential regimes are harmful. Um, Action 6, where uh, the main implementation vehicle is the multilateral instrument, which has been signed by 94 jurisdictions. Uh, we're not so much pushing signing so much anymore as getting ratifications because, of course, the instrument is not of any value if it has not been ratified. And so the number of ratifications is going up. We're up to 53 right now with uh, several in the pipeline and coming soon. Then there's Action 13, um, which has been introduced, the country by country reporting by 93 jurisdictions. We should be releasing some additional information on that. And of course, um, we will be having the 2020 reviews of the minimum standards of the BEPS uh, project uh, going forward. And you have seen already, I believe, a co public consultation on Action 13. You'll be seeing one shortly on Action 14. Um, the Action 14 review of the implementation of the, the current uh, terms of reference of Action 14 is, is going well with almost 70 jurisdictions having been reviewed and 1,500, as you can see on the slide, 1,500 recommendations having been issued. On tax transparency, a lot of this work being carried out by our global forum on transparency and exchange of information. They continue to move forward um, in implementing those standards, both on exchange of information on request and also automatic exchange. There are now around 7,000 bilateral exchanges on an automatic basis as compared uh, to 2019. This is a 15% increase. The number of uh, jurisdictions signing the multilateral convention on mutual administrative assistance and tax matters is up to 141. Despite COVID, we had four additional uh, countries come in to sign the convention. So that now covers over 8,500 exchange of information relationships. Then on our tax and development work, that has also continued though largely through virtual means given uh, COVID-19, but we have stepped up our e-learning and uh, helping countries virtually. So. Uh, our capacity building uh, efforts have continued. The tax academies we have to train tax crime investigators have held their courses virtually. Tax Inspectors Without Borders continues with uh, 80 programs having been completed. Um, the platform for collaboration on tax has also continued to issue toolkits and we are helping countries bilaterally to make best use of those toolkits. So if we go to the next slide very quickly, we will talk about the issues in transfer pricing, which uh, many of you have raised and brought to our attention saying that with COVID-19, we need to um, address some issues because there's been significant business disruption with widespread losses. Um, there's been a lot of government intervention and companies have received uh, assistance from governments. And so how do you deal with transfer pricing in those circumstances? That has been um, raised to us practical questions such as the impact and comparability analysis for APAs. And so um, recognizing that there are some issues here, our working party six is working to develop a coordinated response. And we do hope uh, to get out some guidance on this by the end of 2020. Now I'll turn it over to the birthday boy. Thank you all so much. Uh, yeah, aging this day like any other day, but uh, thank you all. Listen, very quickly because we're late, the forthcoming publications, you can move to the next slide, uh, we'll have many other things coming out uh, soon. Uh, BEP section 14 map review reports, um, uh, the uh, public consultation document, 
the map statistics, and that's very important because it's about tax uh, certainty. We all uh, uh, care about. Uh, we will have a methodology for the peer review of Action 13 minimum standard. We'll have the review of the uh, preferential regime, regimes and uh, the 2020 uh, results, because as long as Pillar 2 is not adopted, and I respond to one of the questions asked, um, Action 5 is still fully implemented, both on transparency of rulings, but also on the fight against harmful tax regimes. So please uh, stay tuned uh, to all the upcoming uh, publications. Uh, and maybe in the remaining five minutes, uh, we could uh, move to the Q&As and uh, I'll uh, revert to Hazel for her to uh, go through the questions which uh, have been asked. Hazel. Perfect. Thank you very much, Pascal. We'll go through the ones that we've received on Zoom. Uh, so, Grace. Um, in pillar one, uh, the main outcomes, you have identified a guiding principle pricing of removal of unilateral measures. Can you explain, please, if this only relates to unilateral DSTs, or does this also extend to other sector specific unilateral taxes that are calculated on a gross basis and which are also designed to fall outside tax treaties? Yes, thanks for the question, whoever sent it in. I think there were a couple of different people who formulated a similar question. Um, on this, uh, one thing I can say for sure is, well, first, the inclusive framework said that it was important as part of uh, the full-fledged solution to have elimination of uh, relevant unilateral measures. And um, so while it is very clear that there will be a need to have elimination of DSTs, um, I, we have not yet determined what relevant unilateral measures will be. That of course will depend on the ultimate scope of the solution and the ultimate uh, package that is agreed. So that remains for further discussion, um, but certainly uh, the, the sense that we have gotten from discussions is that it will not be limited to digital services taxes. Thank you very much, Grace. Uh, David, I have a question for you. Has an impact assessment on investments been done regarding an eventual scenario where Pillar 2 gets implemented, but Pillar 1 does not, due to a lack of political agreement, such that DSTs remain in place or continue to grow in number? Uh, thanks very much, Hazel, and thanks for the question. Uh, we do uh, attempt to provide some indication of what the separate effects of Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 might be although um, the main assumptions that we operate under is that there would be the combined effect of the two pillars and that uh, obviously there's an interaction between the two. In terms of uh, digital services taxes, uh, we operate under the assumption that they would be uh, withdrawn and that there would not be the introduction of any future uh, digital services taxes. Um, just on the assumptions, uh, I see there were a number of other questions about um, the caveats. Um, they are all detailed in much greater detail in the report than what we can go into here, but we will also have an opportunity next Tuesday at a dedicated webcast on the impact assessment to answer any specific questions. Thank you, David. Um, Pascal, perhaps uh, I've, I can group this question here. Um, are there any valuable takeaways for developing countries? Um, like what are the likely impacts of digitalization of tax matters? on the taxable capacity of developing countries during the, the COVID-19 pandemic? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question and a concern that developing countries, which are part of the negotiation, have expressed. Uh, they've said, well, there is not necessarily much for us in Pillar 1. Actually, there is something uh, on Pillar 1 for developing countries, and I think the impact assessment shows it. As regards Pillar 2, the rule order, as explained by uh, AIM, goes first to the income inclusion rule before going to the uh, under tax payment rule. So there is the feeling also there that for developing countries, there is not uh, enough, even though the impact assessment shows that uh, if you address the issue uh, of, uh, I mean, if you, if you agree uh, something like Peter 2, uh, in even with this rule order, 
there is benefit for both the source and the residents countries, and there is an ongoing discussion on the subject to tax rules. So for developing countries, it's not a key priority addressing the tax challenges of the digitalization of the economy, but there is something in there for them. And what we think at the OECD working closely with them is that the, uh, there is room for uh, putting on the agenda of the inclusive framework more work which would be of direct relevance and use for, to developing countries. Developing countries in the course of the negotiation said on digital we're not in a hurry, we'd better take some more time to find a better solution than uh, going too fast. So they were pretty happy I think uh, that uh, the uh, solution would shift to 21, hopefully instead of being agreed in 2020. And maybe with that uh, Hazel uh, will have to uh, close. We are apologize for being too long again, but we had much to say. It's a, it's a big uh, package uh, which was delivered today, even though it's not uh, an agreed package, it's not a new set of rules which will have an impact, but it gives a pretty good sense of what a, um, a new set of rules could look like. It also identifies the pending questions on which your comments will be welcome, your uh, remarks uh, and uh, constructive suggestions uh, throughout the public consultation. We will take uh, the next uh, coming, the upcoming weeks uh, to take some rest from some members of the team who have not uh, slept much uh, nor eaten much over the past uh, few weeks, few months, I would say. So they may take a couple of weeks of break while you are going to work on the uh, commons. We we'll also keep working with the members, all the members, to see what uh, is the best way uh, to sort out the remaining differences so that next year when we have a new political dynamic early in 21 after the public consultation meetings after some other consultations that the secretariat will be holding uh, till the end of the year we can see uh, whether the dynamic is good enough to conclude on pillar one and on pillar two uh, we believe it's feasible. We don't want to oversell this and say, no, come on, we're just at the eve of the agreement. Not the case, but all the conditions are gathered, at least technically, for the politicians to decide. And what we hear from the politicians across the world is they want a solution that is true for all inclusive framework members. So let's make sure that this doesn't go to waste because at the time of COVID, I think the last thing we need, the last thing we want is a trade war. The impact would be big, 1% uh, uh, growth less, and, and actually it's 1% additional recession, uh, which would be awful. Uh, this marginal percentage uh, could have a very, very negative impact. All the conditions are there, the institutions are there to build on the tax corporation, which has been uh, improving for the past 12 years, to keep countries together and to address the tax challenges of globalization, the tax challenges of digitalization, and uh, to build a new international tax system. This will happen. The only question is when and how. Will it take a few months of hard negotiations? Will it take a few years after some chaos? I mean, as uh, international civil servants, as dedicated to try to keep the world a better place and a uh, more uh, odd place, we hope that this can be done through cooperation with your support, with your help uh, to you all. So uh, let us wish you a good reading uh, of all the documents and uh, looking forward to interact with you in the coming weeks and in the coming months. Thank you very much to the team. I think you can all appreciate the amount of work which has been delivered thanks to the delegates of the inclusive framework because they are doing uh, that work as well through all the working parties. Uh, and uh, thanks for the participants and the people who attended these tax talks. Uh, see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Keep safe.